Uh, really quick, first of all, that was great. I, I loved Eric's presentation. It's actually something I've, I've been working on off and on, not as well by any stretch of the imagination for some years, so that was fabulous. And I actually want to pick up where you left off. You said uh, making fun serious. How do we make fun serious? I actually want to ask how we make serious fun and what happens when we don't. So what I'm going to talk to you about today very briefly, very quickly, I should say, is the new communication ecology in local communities, why it's not working. We have news deserts emerging across the United States in various ways that we are barely perceiving yet, and what can we do about it? Those are the three things I want to discuss with you today. I'm going to flip through a few slides uh, very quickly, and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, my other lesson I learned today was never go after a game designer. That's stupid <laughs> when you're making a presentation. Um, but in any case, uh, this is my cool game here. No, actually, uh, this, was a, this is a presentation I made about three weeks ago as a principal investigator of a national project looking at the critical information needs of local communities in the United States. And to make a long story very, very short, we looked at needs in the eight areas, education, health, transportation, emergency risk, and so on across multiple dimensions, particularly looking at diversity. And what we found is that the critical information needs of Americans are not being met, particularly in low-income minority communities, and they're being met less and less as each year goes by. Now, you may ask yourself, this starts with a paradox, right? Well, with all of the information on the net, with the explosion of information on the net, how is that even possible? Aren't we living in a world of rapidly growing exponential information of every sort for everybody? And the short answer answer is no. And the reason that the answer is no, I'm going to show you in a sec with a little bit of luck. Nope. Not that luck. Ah, here we go. Nope. Where is my PowerPoint? On the desktop. So I need to minimize to get there. Are you, Peter? <laughs> Minimize this. As Magda Konietzna is here, um, uh, who is actually a, a PhD student of mine, although after having had this debacle, I'm not sure she would want to admit it. But, uh, <laughs> and she can, she can attest that uh, I'm hopeless with any Windows-related machine. Thank you, Peter. OK. <laughs> So, um, so what you see here is a very long academic PowerPoint, and don't worry because you're not going to see it. Although this, there, 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 there will be a quiz on this chart. Please begin memorizing now. Okay, popular biological ecology. We'll get back there in a moment. Um, uh, but actually, I want to start here. This is the historical media ecology. This is what it used to look like in local communities. This is known as the Rossi or the umbrella, umbrella model. And if you think about it for a moment, it's very familiar to most of you. The one is the newspaper, the big newspaper, the Boston Globe, in this case, wherever, whatever community you come from, that covered everything. And then underneath it were these areas of newspapers and satellite cities. And it just kept going down, down, down. And eventually it reached all these little four micro local daily small local events. They didn't all get in that big one community-wide, metro-wide area. But sort of everything got covered because there was a top-down system for covering it. And this is the old news ecology in a nutshell. The newspaper drove the old news ecology. The newspaper was the center of it. And as I'm going to show you in a minute, this didn't quite come through, but it still is. So I'm actually also telling you a tale of two cities. It's a lot to do in 10 minutes. And that tale of two cities are Baltimore and Seattle. Baltimore is right here. It got cut off. But the main story about from Baltimore is, is that this large, uh, where does news in Baltimore come from? This is, this is from a result that was done by the Pew, uh, Pew Center for Excellence in Journalism uh, in 2009. And they looked at all the news in Baltimore. They did a comparative study. I won't give you the details. But essentially, they said, what's all, look, all the news in Baltimore, online, offline, where is it coming from? They content analyzed it. And lo and behold, 95% of it was coming from traditional sources. And of those traditional sources, 50 per full percent of it was coming from the Baltimore Sun, from the newspaper. Another 30% was coming from local television stations. I'm talking about news on the web now. The, the, these other, uh, that lower, uh, about 15% was from niche media, community newspapers, ethnic newspapers. And then finally, way down something in the 5% range, you get original content from new media. So the point here is that if we think that new media 
of all sorts, blogs, Twitter, and so on, is actually going to create new news in local communities, the evidence shows us that it's not. And that when newspapers go away, you've essentially taken the richest source feeding the local online news ecology. So essentially you're starving out, not just, you're not just, it's not just newspapers that are dying, but the whole local news ecology begins to die. And what that happens, what happens then, and this will also be on the quiz, uh, is, that, is that we start to get a news desert. So I want to tell you really briefly how this is happening. And this is pretty familiar to most of, most of you here. This is the modern era, as it's cleverly labeled, uh, of, of news. And essentially what we had was a fairly, you know, couple of TV stations, a newspaper feeding of radio stations, local news, all still all came from the newspaper. They drew heavily on elite networks. Occasionally they would go to the grassroots for a quote from the so-called person in the street, right? Actually, it was called man in the street back then. And people would have some personal communication, but it was face-to-face -face and phone. And the only way that that could rise up into the larger media ecology was if a reporter, usually, I mean, with some exceptions, if a reporter interviewed them, right? So this was a top-down communication system. It was relatively connected, but still. On around 1990, the decade of the 90s, we start to get only a couple things added in. We get email added in. We get portals added in like Yahoo and AOL. And we begin to get the emergence at the end of this area, really in the early 2000s, of blogs. And as you can see, it doesn't look too much different. It's starting to get a little more complicated. But, but what we do have here for the first time is an actual flow of communication throughout the whole system. So what this does is this connects the bottom to the top for the first time in a, in a complete network in the local community, but the news is still coming top down. Today, nationally, we still have a system that is, there's a lot of bottom up stuff here. These are N stand for personal networks, Facebook and so on, Twitter. Um, there's still a lot of bottom up communication going on here, but the news is still largely generated nationally. Uh, and you just you'll, you'll have to take my word for that for this in this 10 minute presentation. But what I just explicated for you that's true locally with newspapers providing a huge amount of the original content is also true nationally. So our national news ecology is actually also very dependent upon newspapers. But our local news ecology is still equally dependent upon newspapers, even though, as you can see, there's a lot more bottom up communication here. So the possibility for bottom up communication from neighborhoods, cleverly labeled neighborhood one and neighborhood two in this diagram, and people's personal networks and filtering up through Facebook and Twitter, it's there. So we have a system where there could be a bottom-up system of, of local communication ecology, but we don't have that. Empirically, we just don't. Without newspapers, right now at least, to be the beating heart of that local news ecology, we will have news deserts. And in this study, uh, this collaborative study, we reviewed a thousand sources of lo on local community information needs with about 25 scholars across the country. We scoured the literature to see is there any, is there any evidence that, that the information needs of communities are being met alternatively in, in, in different forms of new media. And there is some scant evidence, but for the most part, what we find is if you want to know if you're, a, if, you're a, if you're a woman who needs to know or a, a parent who needs to know where am I going to get well baby care for my child in this community, uh, you're not going to find that online in most places. I know it seems odd, where if you are, it's going to be buried in some website three layers deep that you have to have some fairly decent searching skills to find. Um, in South Texas, there was a tornado about a couple of years ago. Uh, local radio didn't cover it. It hit Hispanic communities particularly hard, surprisingly, because there was no Spanish language news uh, in, those, in those areas, even though there were a lot of Spanish language stations. So the long and the short of it is, is that we have these news deserts emerging around the country. And what can we do about it? I want to come to that as a sort of last three minutes. Well, I can say a lot in three minutes. Um, um, what do we do about it? That brings us back to here. <laughs> no, actually, it does in a weird way, but I'm not going to go through this in three minutes. Um, the, the trick here is how do we begin to capture the middle level of the community? How do we set up a new news ecology that takes advantage of the kind of experiments that Eric was just talking about? Where here we have this marvelous example in Detroit of both you know, older people and younger people through this medium of gaming generating a lot of conversation about real civic problems in Detroit. Fabulous project. 
How does that enter the news cycle? How do we begin to create a new ecology of news that will actually feed the new, feed newspapers or feed something like newspapers? So my, my central thesis is that without newspapers, the news ecology can't survive. And I don't just mean paper. It's going to transform into an online form. But there has to be some site for local journalism. Because if there's not some site for local journalism, the school board won't be covered. The, the, uh, uh, the job situation won't be covered. Uh, we li the average American metro metropolis has 100 municipalities, 100 units of government in it. St. Louis, for example, has 790. Um, without news, not just online commentary, there can be no coverage of government. So what can we do about that? There's no simple answer to that question. I wish I had an answer, but part of the answer is to connect these different layers the micro level of interpersonal communication, the meso layers of neighborhood and community-wide communication, and the metropolitan-wide layer that traditionally was represented by newspapers. Um, one possible uh, answer is found in Seattle. Seattle is the, I told you it was a tale of two cities. Um, Seattle is the second city, and Seattle is a city where they actually developed this rich meso news ecology because the Seattle Times has cooperated with organizations like the West Seattle Blog, which despite its appearance actually covers a neighborhood, neighborhood of 70,000 people. It's really a, a news organization at the meso level doing everyday news, about 70,000 people in West Seattle, the Times has helped, rather than partner against, or rather, rather compete against the West Seattle blog, it's partnered with the West Seattle blog and 30 other blogs like that in Seattle. The government in Seattle has also invested in neighborhood-based communication systematically, and if you, I've actually have a case study coming out in 2013 that describes how Seattle has been reorganized partly through the efforts of government. And so the short answer is that we need to do some very important experiments in the next several years, but they're not being done. Unfortunately, Knight Foundation is a great organization, but almost all the money that's going right now is into technology experiments. We aren't dealing with whole community communication experiments. And if we're going to discover what the new ecology looks like, we need to begin experimenting now with what these new communication slash news ecologies would look like. Thank you, Peter.